So I basically, I presume that we we've seen some real stuff uh, last week with uh, stochastic optimization and all, all kinds of numerical tricks that uh, are used to train uh, large and deep uh, neural networks. So basically, you can do real things with, with these tools already. So today, we'd like to talk a little bit about uh, recurrent neural networks. And I will give you some signal processing uh, metaphors that you can to understand the, the difference and the, the similarity between the uh, kind of neural networks and the regular CMS that we have seen so far. So basically, one of the one of the major limitations that we have. So for example, if we take a multi-layered perception as our network, this major limitation is that the input dimension is fixed. Right? So we have an input vector that has a fixed given dimension. We can select any dimension we want, but, but it must be the same. And then the output dimension is also fixed. Okay? Now, of course, by using convolutional neural networks, we can, uh, we can overcome this limitation. Convolutional neural network can be applied to an input of any size, also a, a string, an infinitely infinite long uh, sequence of, of data. However, still, even when using CNS, uh, we cannot really use, we cannot not really simply incorporate the notion of persistence. For example, when I'm, when I'm watching a video and I would like to analyze, to classify, for example, what is happening in every frame, what kind of event is happening in every frame, of course I would like to use what I have seen before, <coughs> in order to decide what I'm seeing now, right? So basically this is kind of persistent. But if we try to analyze the way we think, at least from our subjective experience, uh, we never think from scratch, right? We always carry on some previous stuff in our continuation of, of the current of the current stuff. So basically this kind of persistence, at least, is not trivially incorporated into a CNN, though I will show you uh, towards the end that this can be done, this is actually a very powerful alternative to, uh, to recurrent neural networks. Basically, some people will say that this is the only right way uh, to, uh, to incorporate persistence. But basically, one of the ways to, uh, to build persistence into our networks is by using recursion, basically by constructing some recurrent relation. And this gives rise to, to recurrent neural networks, which are also known under the abbreviation of RNA. Okay. And the basic recurrent neural network works very much like a dynamical system, right? Like a nonlinear dynamical system. So we have some state defining the, the system, but this state is hidden, it's unobservable. From this state, the system produces the, the next state and the output, if there is an output. Okay? And sometimes the hidden state is directly observable, so the state is directly the output. So basically, we have a system that looks like this. We have we have some input. Let me let me write the input. We have some input here. I will be known by the index p, the time index. So I'm assuming that my input is a sequence. The network produces some output that I will call y p, and it has some states current state ht minus 1 and it produces a new state ht and the time is assumed to be discrete so it's in time is quantized in integer time time okay. and here I have some functional relation let's say the state update will look like some parametric function f parameterized with a set of parameters theta of ht minus 1 xt and the output will be some function, let's call it g theta, might be a different set of parameters, but let's collect them together into, into a single vector theta. Uh, the output will be a function of h. Okay? And this g by itself, so basically let me write this g. So this is f, and this is g. This by itself can be some, some, some kind of uh, neural network as well. Okay. 
So this is this is uh, this is an RNN. You see, basically, we have recursion. So we we carry on the context of what we have done previously to the next iteration, to the next time sample uh, that the network processes. Okay. Very simple idea. So basically. It, again, it's a dynamical system. The only thing that it might be nonlinear, and basically systems with feedback and nonlinearity are notoriously difficult to analyze. There, therefore, if we have some theory about feed forward networks, networks with feedback are they basically they define analysis quite quite persistently because again these are very complicated systems. They have some chaotic behavior, for example. Uh, uh, Attractors in the in the parameter space and things like that. It's, it's quite they're quite difficult to Okay. Now, what is used in practice? So, a, a very basic recurrent neural network uses the following function. So, H T, the new state, will be given as the output of a nonlinear of an element-wise nonlinearity with a matrix W. I will call it H H. H T minus one plus W X H X C plus some B. Okay? And phi is typically selected to be the hyperbolic tangent. So basically it's a function that saturates between minus one and two. Okay? And the output can be just a linear transformation. Of the state. Okay. So this is a vanilla uh, cell for a recurrent neural network. And of course, if we want to put dimensions, so if HT, if this, if this is an, let's say this is an RK, this. K-dimensional vector. Uh, this matrix will be K by K. Suppose X is an n-dimensional input. This matrix will be will be uh, K by n, right? So it takes an n-dimensional vector and gives an k-dimensional vector. This will obviously be a k-dimensional vector, and this matrix, let's say Y. The output is n dimensional, this will be an n by k dimensional. Okay? Now, again, this is this is a very simple layer, right? But remember that we repeat it multiple times. So uh, a useful metaphor would be to unroll this recurrence into something that looks like a feed forward neural network. So let, let me Draw it here. So let me still write this F. I start with some initial state H0. This initial state can be learned, or usually it is fixed, let's say fixed at zero. So we start with a zero vector, zero state vector, means meaning that the network starts from scratch, it doesn't have any memory. We feed into it an input x1. We produce a state h1. We feed it into f. Feed here the input x2. Produce a state h2. And so on. Okay? Of course, what is important is that and like a regular feed-forward network, and like a regular, let's say, MLB, here all the layers share the same burden. Okay, it's the same thing huh? that we, we use in, 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 in every way. Still, this network has uh, quite, uh, quite a significant representation power. We can show basically the same theorem that exists for uh, feed-forward neural networks, that these are also universal approximators. We can approximate any Reasonable, with a measurable function. Okay, and of course there are many ways. There are a few typical ways to use uh, a current neural network. So let's 
see a few of them, so I will just show you a few pictures from Andrei Karapati's uh, uh, blog page. He wrote an interesting blog a few years ago uh, uh, titled the, uh, the Unreasonable Power of uh, uh, Recurrent Neural Networks, probably mimicking Eugene Wigner's book, The Unreasonable, uh, Unreasonable Power of Mathematics. Now, I think, with all due respect, Wigner wrote about the power of mathematics based on about three or four hundreds of years of evidence basically stemming from the success of the scientific method and the power of mathematics in describing the physical nature and uh, let's say I think this kind of uh, comparison between the unreasonable power of mathematics and the unreasonable power of recurrent neural networks was a little bit premature because I think now it, now it become a lot of evidence that there are much better alternatives than recurrent neural networks Okay. Anyway, but the examples are full, so I will show you a few, a few pictures from this, uh, from this book. So, one of the standard ways to use a neural network, of course, as we have seen, basically we call it one to one. So we have a fixed dimensional input and we have a fixed dimensional output. Okay. Now, another way to use this kind of a current neural network, we can call it one to many. So basically the input is still a single fixed dimensional input x, so we don't have a sequence anymore, we just input one x, and then we carry on with this state, so basically we apply recur uh, recur uh, this recurrent relation, and of course the state changes and gets updated, and we output, uh, we output basically an output sequence. Now why this can be helpful? This can be helpful in cases where the output might have a varying length. So for example, suppose we have an image captioning, image annotation problem. We are inputting an image, which can be thought as something of, of a fixed dimension, or if it is not an image itself, it's some kind of a feature vector that represents it. For example, we could use it using a CNN, and the output would be some phrase, some sentence, describing what is, what is going on in the picture. Of course, I cannot tell ahead of time how many words or characters will appear in this sentence, right? So for that, we need some kind of a variable output, and let's say the sentence will terminate with some reserved terminating uh, uh, symbol. Okay? So this is, this is a one-to-many uh, case. Now, we, we might have the opposite case of many-to-one. Suppose we have a textual sequence, let's say we have a phrase or a paragraph, and we would like to, let's say, analyze what is called this sentiment classification. We would like to analyze whether the writer is angry, happy, sad, I don't know, uh, basically some kind of emotional state of the writer. An emotional state can be described either as some discrete class or some maybe probability distribution over the, the, the few possible classes. So the output will be a fixed dimensional vector, but the input can be of any length, right? It can be any sentence. So in this case, we have a sequence, a sequence of inputs, then we take the last state maybe transform it in some way and produce them. Okay? Now we might have a many-to-many -many case. In, in this case, we have an input and uh, of a variable length and an output also of a variable length, but importantly, the length of the input and the output might be different. So, and of course, probably the most prominent example would be machine translation. So let's, let's say we take a trivial sentence in English, let's say, uh, the cat ate the mouse. Okay? So we have five words, we have a certain grammar that determines the order of, of the words in this sentence. Well, say we want to translate this sentence into Italian. Let's say, so we write un gatto, ha mangiato, un to. Okay, so here the grammar is very similar, so the order of, of the words in the sentence is very similar, except that we have these, these two words corresponding to the verb ate. So specifically in Italian, this past tense is formed with using an auxiliary verb like, uh, like corresponding more or less to English uh, present perfect, but having a different sentence. Okay? But again, the number of the number of the number of uh, Words in the output is different, and if we, we analyze this on a character level, of course, there is no alignment of characters. But still, we can say that this is a very simple 
correspondence, right? Just out of two words in place of one. If we, for example, want to translate this to, to German, then it will be more complicated. Because in German, for example, the, the, the verb will go at the end of the sentence. And in this, in this case, for example, it would be the uh, Katze at eine Maus gegessen, right? Pardon my job. Uh, so basically, this at gegessen is the corresponding correspondence of eight, right? And we need somehow to hold in our memory uh, the uh, the context of the phrase in order to basically to bracket this eine uh, Maus with the auxiliary verb and the and the sense verb from both sides, right? So basically, uh, we need some kind of a context in order to be able to perform these tasks. And here, the input and the output dimension is completely different and completely arbitrary, right? So basically, for this, we need a, a, a many-to-many uh, architecture. Right? And I will show you exactly how it is done in practice. And then we might have some many-to-many -many applications. For example, imagine that we have some input, uh, let's say, cons consisting of video frames. And as the output, let's say we would like to produce some new video frames that have been processed in some way. For example, we we improve the um, let's say we improve the resolution or we move the noise. So we would, would like somehow to be able to take advantage of this temporal context, but still the number of inputs and outputs will be the same. It will be aligned. In this case, it is also a many-to-many, -many, but an aligned an aligned work. Okay. Another example that I would like to show you. We might have uh, as the input something that is not necessarily naturally representable as a sequence. For example, we might have an image, but we can still do some kind of a sequential operation in an image. So here you can see there is this window that slides over or slides over an image, like uh, basically our site follows different details uh, in the image and shifts attention from one place to another place. With with the, with the goal to to perform recognition, to perform visual recognition. So even though the image is not is not naturally represented as some temporal sequence, but we can still think of it as a temporal sequence when we shift this uh, attention needle. And here is another example where actually this kind of a sequential uh, processing is used to synthesize. Okay. Where does the sequence start? Well, it starts, it starts somewhere. It will probably be something random, and then according to the according to the data, it will it will adjust the position of the window. So this is called these are called attention networks. I will show you basically how exactly it works. Okay, and this is this is a very powerful technique that is typically combined with Okay. Yeah. Okay. They, 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 they are much 
better, better behaved systems. So I would say that more or less CNNs correspond, in this metaphor, correspond to FIR. They have maybe a very large but finite uh, memory in terms of the receptive field of the, basically the amount of signal that they see uh, corresponding to every output. And recurrent neural networks can potentially see an infinite history. But in practice, you can never take advantage of such an infinite history. Okay? So, so basically, the, I, I guess this is, this is the analogy, but again, the formal connection is not necessarily considered. Okay? So again, this is basically this is our uh, this is our recurrent neural network unfolded into a feed-forward neural network. Pay attention that we are using the same uh, parameter for every wave. Okay. Now let me show you another example. Basically, this is the example of one uh, one to many network that I mentioned before. So in one to many network, we have an input uh, of a fixed dimension and the outputs might be a sequence with variable and variable uh, dimension, variable number of elements. And again, an example could be image capture. So let's say our input is an image. We apply some CNN to it. We produce some feature vector that has a fixed dimension. And then on that feature vector, we can apply an RNN to generate this okay? And we'll see in the tutorial, we'll see actually how to work with language models. I will show you some toy examples. Okay. Now, the, one to, the, one, the many to many networks are usually implemented in two stages. So we have an encoder decoder architecture. This is quite typical. So we first we first build a many to one network that takes a sequential input, produces typically no output, and we take the final state from this network. So the final state encodes the context of this entire sequential input. Okay. That state is fed to initialize uh, the state of an encoder network that takes no input. It just takes this state. It processes by modifying the state from, from uh, uh, time step to time step. And it produces the sequential. Okay. And this is a typical way to, to do these many to many transformations where the number of input and output dimensions is not the same. Okay. Now, basically, you can think of this time dimension as depth. So if you think of an RNN as a, as a feed-forward neural network, basically the time is equivalent to depth. But you can actually build a two-dimensional structure. Okay? So, so if this is the time, let's call it length, we can build a network that outputs, so we have some first lowest layer of an RNN that we can unfold in time. And its output will be will be served as the input to the to the following layer. Okay? It will also start with some initial state. It will evolve this state in time, and it will produce an output that will be used as the input to another layer of the of the economy. So basically we can build a few layers on top, and of course the final layer will be the output. Okay? So this is something that is also quite common in, in the current world. So basically, the representative power here comes both from the temporal recurrence and of, from this layer. Okay. Any questions? Yes. How do you control? You said the weights are equal to all the. So in this case, the weights are equal. So, uh, so basically, there is, there is no, there are no multiple boxes. Yeah. This is just, just, uh, just the representation. So yeah, basically, right. all. This function is key, right? We are just mm -hmm. repeating it on different inputs. Of course, this function will have a different. Potential. Yeah, but still, different like uh, if you have like really short uh, uh, dependency or, or history, you know, like you have a window. Mm -hmm. So how that will it just like happen through the training, or will it take so uh, much more than needed, and then? Okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll talk about training. So training is, is always an issue with so there a few powerful techniques, but training is an issue, and I will show you exactly why. Basically, uh, of course, we need to train by vector propagation. If we, if we supervise training, we need to train by applying the chain. Okay? We, we, ideally, we would like to take as long term context as possible. Yes, a question, please. Uh, in the top layer, the signal propagates immediately. 
over, over time. Oh, so basically, all this happens as a single instance. As a, as a yeah. single instance. Right? So basically, so there is no really such a thing as these replicated boxes. These are just the unfolded. So this is some kind of a metaphorical unfold. Basically, this is what happens at different stages in time. But basically, this is a feed-forward network in this direction and a recurrent network in this direction. Okay. Yes. What is the logic behind Well, basically, you want uh, you don't want the so if you just put outputs here, they will be necessarily aligned to the input, right? When the input finishes, then the output also finishes, right? And you prefer like in this in this case, if you want if, if you want the output to be at a different length, you need somehow to split the input. So let's let's talk about training of RNN. So so basically we have again our parametric function that I uh, that I described here, and we would like to we would like to uh, we would like to train it. And usually, suppose we are let's say we are learning some language model or some sequential model. Basically, what we will typically have, we'll have some loss that, of course, depends on our parameters theta. Remember that this parameter theta uh, parameterizes a single cell, which is then repeated in time, right? That is the same set of parameters. Usually, it will be some, some set of point-wise losses, or basically sample-wise losses, that depend on the output of the network at time t. And of course, y t depends on the parameters, obviously, and depends on the inputs that I'm not, I'm not specifying. So basically, we have these individual loss functions that we are summing over uh, all, all the samples in time. And potentially, at least theoretically, this is an infinite sum. We start at some p0 and we go to infinity. It's an inf infinite stream of inputs. Well, in practice, of course, we have some finite amount of an example, but it can be very long. For example, we want to train on the entire Wikipedia corpus of text, which is, I don't know, a few gigabytes of data. I don't know how many words, but probably hundreds of thousands. Uh, so computing all these sums, so imagine now you want to back propagate through these sums. So imagine just, imagine this, this illustration with 100,000 sets. It's impractical, right? So you want to do a forward pass and then do a backward pass. I'm not talking about numerical problems like managing gradients and basically things like that. We'll, we'll get to them immediately now. But just computationally, this is an infeasible task. We need to keep all these things in memory. The so this is clear and infeasible. So what is done instead, so this is basically, this is called back propagation through time. So I, I, will, I will point you a few differences from regular back propagation. But if you think of recurrent neural network as a feed forward network, then we can just apply it simple back propagation rule, right? So the only difference compared, let's say, to an MLP, in MLP, each layer has a different set of parameters. So when we did back propagation, we actually stored, so we basically have every pass of the, back, of, the, of, the backward, of the backward pass of the back propagation class. When we reach each layer, we store the gradient for the parameters of that layer, right? So the gradient of the loss with respect to the parameters of that layer, right? So we store basically a sequence of gradients, which were essentially the components of a single long gradient vector with respect to all the parameters. Now, we are sharing the same parameters in this set. So essentially, instead of just keeping all these gradient terms, we are summing them. So the loss depends on the parameter set, theta, through this relation, through this relation, through this relation, through this relation, and so on. So we need to sum, okay? Which is exactly the same back propagation, back propagation technique, but we are accumulating the gradients instead of instead of stacking the different gradients. Okay. Now, technically, in order to make this step feasible, we don't really do a full forward pass on all the on all these very long sum and then do a full backward pass. What we do is we actually work in chunks, so we increment time by a fixed with a not very long amount of temporal steps, and then we back propagate also by a fixed amount of steps. Okay? And then we do again a forward pass, and then again a backward pass. 
And this is called truncated backpropagation for example. So this is, the backpropagation is truncated after a certain fixed number of steps. So maybe computation is feasible. Of course, we still carry on the context that we have achieved so far by the forward path. So basically, once we are doing this for many, many such chunks, we are still keeping this long-term context from the beginning of the sequence. Okay, but the backpropagation is done for a limited number of steps. And this, this makes it computationally attractive. Okay? Any questions? Okay, so let's let's do some some simple math. I, I, actually, I would like to write I would like to write the chain rule slightly differently because it will be it will give us some insight about the numerical problems that might happen inside when we when we do that. Question? No. So let's write it in the following way. So I, I would like to compute what we call this delta theta, which is the derivative of L with respect to C, okay? Which is of course given by, let's assume that this sum now runs from P equals one until some capital P, this is our final sequence that we are, we are uh, working with. So we have this sum from one to P. Now of course each Loss, each individual loss in the sum will contribute to the sum of the gradients, right? So we have the sum of these partial derivatives with respect to theta. Okay? Now, what about this term? Let's take an individual term, DLT, to be theta. And basically, we are just considering one of the outputs, let's say this output at some point t. And let's see how this output is influenced by the parameters theta. Okay? So, so what, what do we do? What do we have to do? Sum till t now. Pardon? You will sum again till t. So, I, of course, so this, of course, this tempo step will depend on theta here, and theta here, and theta here, and until the beginning of this. Right? So, basically, let's, so let's first, uh, uh, basically, to this. Uh, to this gradient. So we have, first of all, DLT over D, um, how we call it? We call it DY, right? Y is the output of the network, right? In this notation. DLT to DYT, right? This is, the, this is the gradient of the loss. Now, this will be multiplied, we have two terms here. First of all, we'll have the gradient of yt with respect to theta. And basically, let me, let me denote it. Let me write some funny symbol here. I'm using uh, Joshua Bengel's notation. Let me write d plus here. Now, d plus means that this is an immediate or instantaneous derivative. So it assumes, remember, yt depends on all the past, which is also a function of theta. Okay. But if I'm assuming that my ht is constant in theta, I still have a derivative here, right? Because of this linear transformation. So when I'm indicating this plus sign, I'm assuming the inputs to be constant in theta. Okay? And then it will be perfectly valid. So basically, this is the transformation that the state undergoes uh, uh, in order to produce y. Okay? So this is this is the uh, this is basically the transformation of, this is basically the, the dependence, essentially theta, include all these matrices, right, and the bias term. So basically, one, uh, part of this theta will include the elements of these matrices. And this derivative will capture. Okay? So this is, this is the output part. Now we have another term that actually depends on the state, on ht, right? And here I would have to write a sum, because the state the state brings influence in the past, right? So the state will, will start with some i going from 1 until the present time t, or actually t minus 1, right? It will, be, it will not include t itself, right? It will be t minus 1. And 
So it will be basically inverse by the chain rule. It will be dyt. dyt over dht. dht over dhi. Okay? And then it will be this instantaneous derivative of hi with respect to c. Okay? Make sense? So again, try to follow the diagram. Let's say we have this output y. So this is output y t. This is the function g of theta. This is the function f of theta. This is this is basically h t. It goes forward in time. This is then theta. This is h t minus 1. Basically, we have this graph now. The, and here we evaluate the loss function. So this y, of course, depends immediately on these parameters here, theta. That's why we have this term. Okay. Then it depends on these parameters through h t, right? So we have this term. Then it depends on these parameters through h t minus one. So we have i equals to t minus one. Then we have dependence on t minus 2, that's why we have i equals to t minus 2, until the beginning, until h. Okay, so that's why we have this sum. Okay, makes sense? It's exactly the same back propagation. So back propagation, we completed it recursively. This is just a different way to, 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 to write it. It's exactly the same, the same form. Okay? Now I insist on writing it in this way because we'll see some, some insight. Now let's see what happens here. So basically, every sum here, let's, so I, I will ignore this. The, 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 the important contribution comes from here. So basically, what is written here, this term, tells us how the past at time i contributes to the gradient at time t. Yes. If you have some, say, a Markov or something, you don't need really all this, right? It would be... Well, so it's, so it's not a Markovian model. No, no, but if you have a... But still, even, the, even in Markovian models, if you, if you want to back up probably the evidence, there will be dependence. Yeah, be dependence but... Dependence on previous times. But it would be easier, like... Uh, no? Not really, no. Okay. Not really. So, so maybe, uh, maybe when we speak a little bit about the theory of uh, neural networks and some problems are connected to reinforcement learning, maybe I will mention it will be the connection to, to h in the mark of one. Uh, still, we have, we have these long-term dependencies. And again, this term, basically this entire term here, we can call it temporal contribution to the gradient. So again, it, it tells us how, how the, uh, basically how the parameters that we have, at, that, that basically that influence the state of at time i affect the output of the network at time t. So basically, if we have, if we have i that is significantly farther in the past that, uh, than t, we can call this some kind of long-term contribution, right? So this is long-term history of the network. And if we have something that is of the same order as t, let's call it short. And of course, in this example that I showed you, and I will show you a few more funny examples with, with RNN, basically, uh, we do want to model some long-term context. For example, if we want to translate uh, a paragraph of, of text, sometimes uh, human languages, unfortunately, are ambiguous, right? And sometimes we need to keep in mind basically some kind of global or long-term context in order to be able to uh, disambiguate or interpret correctly some phrase that without context would be ambiguous. Even the meaning of a single word can be ambiguous. Of course, you can think about many examples. Uh, so we want essentially these long-term uh, these long-term contributions to be actually uh, to, to be basically to, 
we would like to compute these great gradients without, for example, them, them decaying or exploding, right? We want these, these gradients to be numerically prime. So let's see what happens to this term. So this term exactly tells us how the error propagates in time, right? Yes, question? Yeah. Yeah, question. In the expansion, uh, d plus h i over the data, mm -hmm. you neglect the contribution of treated h i to the. So, so, so it's, I'm not neglecting. This. So this formula is exact. So it's just it's just that I treat h. Uh, uh, so h. Because h i also uh, depends on theta to theta. Sure. So, so basically, what I would like to write here would be d f theta of h. Uh, of hx, right, evaluated at hi index i over theta. So if I write it this way, it's clear. Okay. Okay, so this is, this is, this is what I mean by d plus. Because you use the plus uh, only for the immediate... Uh, yeah, so this is, a, this is an immediate derivative. So if I write just d over d theta, h here is also a function of theta, right? So I, I, then I will end up with some infinity time. Okay. So I must put here an immediate derivative, basically the derivative of f, assuming that h is a constant. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. We expect that um, this derivative only depends on t minus i, only on two different things, because it's the same way. Well, so um, I, would like, I, would like to, I would like to actually develop this expression. So this expression is exactly what carries information about the gradient uh, from time i to time p, okay? Or basically, when you calculate the gradient from time p to time r, okay? So basically, this, this is what will be responsible for long-term contribution. So let's express this. Let's express dht over dh i, of course. Than okay, so here again we, we apply the chain rule, right? So we start with dht uh, over dht minus 1, dht minus 1 over dht minus 2, right? Until we reach dh1 over dh2, right? Oh, sorry, dhi, dhi over dh, dh plus 1 over dh, right? Okay? So essentially, these are all derivatives. These are all derivatives of f with respect to h evaluated at this is evaluated at h e at c plus 1, right? These are exactly these immediate derivatives. And this is evaluated at h i x i plus 1. Okay? These are, these are these derivatives. So let's now take the specific parametric form that we had, that we had before. So let's uh, let's take, let, let me use this notation. I will be known by Z, T, W, H, H, basically what we had before, H, T minus 1, plus W, X, H, X, T, plus B, okay? Then H, T, the new state, will be phi of Z. Okay, so this is my representation. Of course, I have another, I have another function that uh, produces the output, but I'm interested only in this part of the view. Okay, because we'll see there are some, some phenomena. Of course. So let's see what happens when we calculate this. So when we differentiate with respect to h, right? So we'll, what we will have will be a diagonal matrix with the derivatives of phi, right? This is an element-wise uh, non-linear, therefore we have a diagonal scaling matrix, right? Exactly as we had with back propagation. 
at point, so let's evaluate, let's evaluate dh i plus one over dh i. Okay? So it will be the diagonal of phi prime at point vi plus one. Okay? So this is the this is the outer derivative, and the inner derivative will be wh h transpose, right? Because it scales this h. Okay? Okay? And just check the dimensions. To me, the dimensions of k by k is k is the dimension of the system. This is the Jacobian of h with respect to the previous h. Must be k by k, right? So it's simple calculus. Admittedly, you need to imagine how it looks like uh, in case of tensors, but in, in this case, it is a derivative of vectors with respect to a vector, it's easy to Okay? Now, if we, if we now this, stack these together into this sequence that we have here, essentially, you see, we have a long chain of these operations. We have the diagonal of this phi, phi prime times WHH transpose, diagonal of F phi prime, WHH transpose, diagonal of F, F uh, prime, WHH transpose, right? So we have this, basically, power of WHH transpose, and the power is T minus i. So the longer term contribution we have, the bigger is the power of this matrix WHH, okay? So let's do a very simple analysis. Okay, so we okay. So let's assume that phi is an identity matrix for now. Okay? The linear case is easier to analyze, and it will, it will be quite easy to, to extend it to the general case. Okay, so if phi is the identity matrix, we don't have these diagonal matrices anymore, right? They will be just identity matrices. So what we will have will be WHH transposed to the power L, where L is T minus I. Okay? And this will be, this will be the matrix that will scale the long-term contribution of uh, basically time, time i to the gradient of time p. Now, what can you tell about the algebraic properties of this matrix? So what will happen, what happens when we take a matrix and raise it to a very high power? So basically we can, we can do a naive decomposition of this matrix Take the diagonal of basically the, the matrix with the eigenvalues, mm -hmm. raise them to the power L, and then compose the matrix again. Right? So if we have, let's say, we have a matrix with a simple spectrum, meaning that all the eigenvalues are different, then what will happen? The the basically the the matrix will converge to a rank one matrix with the basically the rank one coming from the eigenspace corresponding to the largest eigen, eigen, eigen vector, right? And the rest will vanish. Of course, if the largest eigenvalue is smaller than one in absolute value, then the matrix will approach zero, right? And this can be captured by the notion that is, that is called spectral radius, which will be known by Rho. So the spectral radius of this matrix is the maximum lambda i, i from one to k, where lambdas are the eigenvalues of the matrix, okay? So if this Rho, if rho is smaller than 1, it means that all the eigenvalues are smaller than 1. It means that this matrix will approach 0 as L goes to infinity, right? So what is the meaning of an eigenvector of an eigenvector and eigenvalue? So there are some privileged directions. So the, what is the action of a matrix on a vector? The matrix rotates the vector and scales its length, right? Right? There are some directions in which the matrix doesn't rotate the vector, only changes its scale. And these directions are called eigenvectors. And the amount of scale is called the corresponding eigenvalue. Okay? Now, if in every direction the scale is smaller than 1, 
It means that if we apply this scaling multiple times, essentially all the vectors will shrink to zero, right? So basically, this condition is a sufficient condition for a vanishing gradient, okay? So this is a sufficient condition. It is not necessary, but if this happens, it is a sufficient condition. So basically, in this case, we have, let's, this is a sufficient condition, basically we have vanishing gradient, vanishing monotone gradient. So it means that in, in this situation, we, we will be really unable to learn long-term context, right? Because the contribution of that long-term context will simply disappear from that propagation, right? So numerically, it will be impossible to, to learn this long-term context. And it, but basically, this is an exponentially fast decay. So we really will lose those gradients after a few tens, maybe hundreds of times 10. And this is a very optimistic situation, okay? So this is a vanishing gradient. Now, what happens if we have the opposite situation, if the spectral radius is bigger than one? Well, there still might be some eigenvalues smaller than one. So some directions might not be amplified by the matrix. Some, some directions still might shrink, right? So definitely, if, if uh, the spectral radius is not bigger than one, then we cannot explore gradient, right? But if some eigenvalues are, are bigger than one, uh, gradients might explode. This is a, a necessary condition, but an insufficient one. Okay, so if we have rho bigger than one, then gradients might explode. Right? Okay, again. A necessary condition by the sufficient one because it might happen that we fall into those subspaces of the matrix that are uh, not amplified, that correspond to eigenvalues uh, smaller than one. Yes? How about the variation that is from the nonlinearity? Okay. The same sure, sure. So let's, let's uh, take the nonlinearity into account as well. So if we take the nonlinearity into account as well, Let's say so let's say we assume that our derivative is bounded by some constant gamma. Okay? And in case of sigma, it would be let's say either one or one one fourth, depending on the type of the function, it is either it's a sigma or a tan h. But basically, we have this bound. So it is quite easy to show that if we have rho smaller than 1 over gamma, we will have a sufficient condition for vanishing gradients. Okay? And if we have rho bigger than 1 over gamma, we have a necessary condition for exploding gradients. Okay? And of course, I'm, I'm being quite sloppy here with the math. We need to be very careful because basically, if the matrix is not symmetric, for example, you cannot bound this norm by, by the spectral radius. But if, we, if you do the, the algebra carefully, you will see that it actually, it actually uh, happens. Okay? So essentially, it means that uh, because of this multiplication, this repeated, repeated multiplication by the matrix W, the, the matrix of parameters, which is not exactly under our control. We are trying to learn it. We don't exactly know what will be its algebraic properties, right? We might end up in one of these situations. But actually, this is what happens in practice all the time. If you're trying to learn this vanilla RNN after, uh, after a few tens or hundreds of time, time steps, there is no chance that you will be able to get uh, to learn long-term long context because it will simply either disappear or will create and numerical instabilities in, in the form of exploding gradients. Okay? So let's do the break. I will show you some numerical tricks. I would say quite miserable numerical tricks to try to solve this problem, and then some slightly more advanced idea that you can solve it better. Okay, okay so, so basically we, we are encountering these vanishing or exploding gradients again. 
And basically, in our analysis, this problem is particularly acute. So first of all, we have this matrix W that uh, that we need to raise to, to, to some power, right? And this is quite problematic because we don't really control what, what goes inside. Uh, another thing that in our analysis, we particularly would like to create very long, deep, long uh, networks that would correspond to deep networks in fit forwardness and if in fit forwardness we have any few tens of layers here we will have hundreds of thousands of iterations that carry on some context. So basically we need some way to deal with these uh, numerical problems. So there are, there have been a few heuristics uh, proposed to deal to deal with it. So just to put things in context, recurrent neural networks exist for, for decades and uh, they have been in very little use just because they don't work. Never work. Uh, so basically, some numerical ideas uh, were proposed to alleviate these uh, numerical problems, but basically one of the ways to, uh, to actually not completely eliminate them, of course, but to, to alleviate them more is the idea of gating. For example, that is found in LSPM networks. That have been proposed in, in the beginning of the 90s and found real use maybe around 2010, 2012, something like that. Basically, that if you look at LSPM, you say, this is, this is a monster. Who needs this? Uh, can, this can, can this work at all? And surprisingly, it worked when uh, basically it was trained on enough data and it was efficiently good. Basically, it took something like that. 20 years before this could, uh, could be applied. But basically, there are a few, a few simple numerical techniques that can be used to uh, not solve completely, but to alleviate this uh, numerical, numerical problem. So first of all, when we initialize the matrix WHH, usually we initialize the matrix at random. So here, we need to be careful when we randomize the matrix. So we randomize the matrix, we would like to scale it in such a way that the spectral radius will be uh, will be something something like uh, will be something like uh, uh, one over gamma rho, right? So if we have this bound on the derivative and we have rho, let's say we initialize the matrix and we found that the spectral radius is rho, we would like to scale it by one over gamma rho to ensure that uh, there will be no exploding grid. But then we might have vanishing grid. So some heuristic more or less tells that you scale the matrix, some initial matrix, by some constant C over gamma rho. Rho is the spectral radius of the initial matrix, and C is somewhere around 1.1. So you cannot guarantee, so basically, it is not guaranteed the gradients will vanish. It is not guaranteed that they will explode, and they might explode, but at least if they explode, it doesn't happen too fast. Okay, this, this is for the initial matrix. Can you flip the gradients and then? Uh, Pardon? Can you flip the gradients and then? Uh, okay, so, so, so this is this is for the initialization of this. Now, when you see that your your gradient uh, grows very fast, you can actually clip. So basically, you put some threshold, and if the norm of the gradient was, you know, gradient by g, okay. I know that I used g before, but in this context, g will be the gradient. So if g is bigger than some threshold tau, then you simply redefine it as tau over g times g. Okay? So basically in this in this way you 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 keep you keep the uh, the scale of the gradient uh, under control. So you don't allow it to explode. Now if you look at this picture here, so I don't know if it's easy to see anything here. So here the, the Basically, what is shown is a very simple single uh, single uh, uh, single cell that is iterated 50 times. Okay, it has two parameters, no bias, just just two parameters. And basically, this is how the loss function on logarithmic scale looks like as the function of these two parameters. Sorry, it's just one w and one b. So there is bias and then the one dimensional. Okay? and one dimensional state. So basically you can see how this behaves with respect to W and B. So basically you have these two plateaus. These are vanishing gradients, right? So this is flat. Gradient here is zero. 
delta of this value where the global mean is found, and delta of this wall on logarithmic scale, since that you are jumping here by an order of magnitude in the in the value of the loss function. So this jump, of course, is an indication of the Okay. But you, if you look at this at, at, at this plot, you see that when the gradient explodes, it explodes in some direction. So there is some direction where the gradient explodes. And you can also see, maybe it's not very clearly visible from this picture, is that usually when the gradient explodes, the, the curvature also explodes. So it means that not only that the function, the rate of change of the function is very big, also the rate of change of the rate of change, the second order derivative, the curvature, is also very big. Okay? So this is, again, there is nonlinear dynamical systems are very difficult to analyze. So there is empirical evidence to this. I doubt that anybody could actually prove this, uh, this statement, even in this trivial and uh, non input and two-dimensional uh, parameter space uh, type of situation. But basically, if we know that the curvature explodes, if we use a second order method, like Newton's method, that instead of making a gradient step, scales the gradient with the inverse Hessian, the, uh, the inverse of the second order derivative matrix, basically those directions corresponding to a very large curvature will be scaled down. Right? You take the inverse of the curvature matrix of the, of the Hessian. It is very big, so one over the big curvature gives you a very small scale. So the gradient is very big, but you attenuate it by a very by a very, uh, by a very big, a big factor. And in fact, second order methods work exceptionally well for RNA. Now, if you, if you think, if you have many parameters in the network, what you need to do in a second order method, you need to construct the Hessian matrix, so you need to evaluate the second order derivative. Let's say you have uh, a few thousands of parameters, you need to build the matrix a few thousand by few thousand. Then you need to invert it, which is really costly. And then you need to basically to the gradient step scale with this inverse Hessian matrix. This is costly, just this inversion is costly. So what is typically done, and in this literature for some reason it's called Hessian free methods, though they are not Hessian free, they use the Hessian. Basically, instead of inverting the, the gradient, you partially invert it by solving an optimization problem. So inverting a matrix or solving solving this system, which is called the Newton system. Basically, you are solving for the descent direction. Typically, you, solve, you just assign the descent direction to be the negative gradient, right? When you use second order method, you scale the direction by h. So it is equivalent to writing minus h inverse g, or solving this system of equation, right? So what you can write instead, you can solve this optimization problem over b. And this can be done efficiently using an iterative method, usually conjugate gradients. I can, I will probably, for for uh, basically for educational purposes, I will write a few pages <coughs> of second order methods. I don't want to focus too much on this. But basically, basically, you can solve this optimization problem only partially, not converging to an exact solution, but maybe making a few tens of iterations, <laughs> multiplying by the Hessian is not as costly as inverting the Hessian. This is only uh, and square, and the Hessian might be sparse, so in practice it is quite much less than that. And then you get something that looks like a descent direction, and you also that don't really need to construct the exact gradient, the exact Hessian, it can be actually approximated from first order information, from outer product of gradients, in, also in the stochastic manner, using, using uh, mini batches. So these methods really work well. There are a few papers, uh, I think quite recent ones, maybe less than 10 years ago, that uh, proposed this so-called Hessian free, or HS for short, method for training RNS, and it, it works really well. So basically, you can, even with this vanilla RNS, with all the problematic problematics that we have because of the multiplication by this matrix WHH, we still uh, suffer from, basically, from lots of numerical problems, but can learn long-term context for hundreds of thousands of <laughs> okay. But there is one more thing that I would like to show you that is not related to the way we train the network, but relates to a different design of the architecture. So if you remember, we talked about 
we talked about uh, residual methods last, last week, right? So I don't know exactly what I didn't watch the video too, too much, but basically I didn't, uh, uh, I didn't know what exactly I told you about resonance, but the idea is so why resonance allow you to learn much deeper networks? Well, because basically we have these steep connections. And when we backpropagate, basically the gradient flows without impediment, jumping over many, many layers, or in this case two layers of a regular congruence on your network, where it would otherwise be multiplied by, by, by this linear operator, right? Or, or it's a joke, and so forth. And some more advanced architectures like DenseNet create longer steep connections that jump over a bigger group. And it works really well. So basically, the idea is to have this unimpeded flow of the gradient from the output to the deep layers, uh, and basically steep connections allowed to do this. So let's try doing the same idea uh, for residual neural networks. And this was proposed around 91, and then later in 94, basically by, uh, the first paper was by Hochreiter and Schmidhuber, and basically uh, Jürgen Schmidhuber claims that he was the first to identify and solve the, the, what he calls this the fundamental problem of deep learning, which is this idea of to deal with vanishing gradients, and probably he's right to some extent, in self-attributing the credit. Uh, uh, but basically the idea is that we would like to, to modify the architecture of this recurrent cell to eliminate the matrix WH from the, from the gradient, from the back population expression, or at least will not be eliminated completely, of course, but there will be some kind of a path that allows the gradient to flow unimpeded backwards in time. Okay? So let's see how to do it. show you is slightly, slightly, so it's basically a, it's a, it's a simplified version of what is actually used in practice, which is called an LSTM, long short term memory network, but basically the idea is, the, the idea of LSTM is exactly the same, it's just, it has just slightly more complicated gating mechanism. So basically let's first build an apparently useless thing, so let's, let me build two signals two type signals, basically that will be computed from the state and the input using sigmoid functions. So sigmoid function is like tan h, but it separates between 0 and 1. So we have some matrix uh, hz multiplying the previous state plus xz multiplying the current input plus bz. Okay, these are two so-called gate signals. So the first one is called the update gate. And this is called the reset gate. Yes, I, I will try to explain you the, the meaning of these signals in a second. So currently we are just producing two time series from our state. And these time series contain values between 0 and 1. Okay. Now, what we are going to produce, we are going to produce, remember, the uh, recurrent neural network produces the next state vector, the next hidden state vector. So what we are going to do, we are going to produce a candidate state update by taking, by taking, the, uh, by taking the sigmoid. So normally we would do this. We would do H. Let's write it. H. Let's write it H H. T minus one. W X H X T plus B H. Okay. So we, this was our normal state of data. Now what we are going to do? We are going to multiply element-wise 
this, this and this. So basically, this, this is called the Hanamar product, which is just a fancy name for saying that we are multiplying two vectors element wise. Okay? So basically, look what happens here. We are taking what we would normally produce as our state of date, at least the linear part of this term, before we apply the time h function, and we are weighting it with this reset gate signal that has values between 0 and 1. So imagine that, imagine, think of this as a, as a soft and therefore a differentiable version of an if then state. So if the, the value of the gate is close to 1, we are carrying on the corresponding coordinate of this vector. If it is close to 0, we are forgetting it. We are resetting it. Okay? This is the idea of gate. Now then, we are going to produce the new state ht so ht will take will take the uh, the previous state ht minus 1 and it will multiply it by the update gate z so basically if this the, wherever the update gate is high we are taking quite a lot of information from the previous state vector and we'll, we'll write here convex combinations it will be 1 minus dt gating Qt. Okay? So basically, if the gate Zt is high, we are taking the previous state, let's say Zt equals 1, exactly. So we are ignoring the current update and we are just carrying on the previous state. Now, what happens when we backpropagate? What happens when we backpropagate? The gradient simply flows unimpeded backwards in time, right? So if we keep this gate Zt high, let's say for a long period of time, we can reach very easily very long-term context backwards in time, right? Because the gradient will not be scaled by anything, it will be scaled by one. Okay? So let's see it from let's see it from the algebra. Uh, let's see it from the algebra. I, I'll just write the final expression, but it's, it's very easy to do this algebra. Simply the chain rule. Basically, what, what is interesting, of course, we are interested in this ht over dht minus 1, right? So remember, the, that was our contribution. Uh, that was basically the term that we multiplied from, p, from i to p, or from p to i, backward to i, and that was the weight, the scale, of the, the long-term contribution to the grid, right? And basically, this term could be either magnified very very significantly by some exponential growth of the power of that matrix WHH, or it can be, it could be um, you know, basically attenuated to zero, also exponentially fast, if we had a spectral radius smaller than one. So now what we are going to get here, I will just write the final expression. We have here, just just do elementary differentiation of this of this term, basically of these of these formulas. It took me five minutes to do. But hopefully no mistakes. So basically, it will be the diagonal of Zt, right? It will be the diagonal of Zt plus Whz transpose times the of sigma prime Whz h t minus one plus Whxz xc plus Bz times that h t minus 1 minus q t plus the same coming from WHH, WHH transpose the sigma prime, WHH, h t minus 1 plus WHH s plus b h, Then one minus z minus one. Hopefully there are no mistakes, but basically what is 
what is interesting here, what is interesting here is basically we have all these terms. It looks exactly like what we had before, right? So slightly more complicated matrices. We have two matrices, matrices here, HZ and HH. So this, of course, will be subject to vanishing or exploding gradient. And if we are careful enough, we can keep the uh, we can keep the norm of this matrix. Uh, or the spectral radius of this matrix below one, so the gradient will vanish. But we also have this term. We also have this term. So if we keep the gate, if we can keep basically this uh, update gate Z open for basically for many time steps, this gradient will propagate an infinite term through the network backwards in time, right? And basically, this will allow the, the contribution from very, very uh, remote history in past to influence the loss at time t. Okay? And it, it basically, this is the idea of gated networks. And of course, as I said, there are many, many architectures. Actually, there has been an empirical study trying basically to do some kind of uh, discrete search in different, in the space of different possibilities to combine these gating functions into a, into a recurrent cell. And basically, more or less, they all perform the same. Exactly. So basically, there is some kind of a misconception that LSTM or gated networks solve all the miracle problems of recurrent neural networks. This is completely false. So basically, you can still using uh, second order methods or gradient clipping, you can still uh, allow basically efficient training even if the gradients explode. You will not suffer from vanishing gradients if you use this technique. Okay, so at least the network can propagate very low term information without uh, suffering from it. Okay? But of course, it doesn't solve magically all the problems existing in time. Okay? So again, I can write this, I can show this as a diagram. I think this is more confusing than, than helpful. Uh, imagine how LSTM works. It's just two more gates. So this, is, so, if, so this is an LSTM cell, which is, for some reason, it is used more frequently than this these vanilla gated networks, which is, are called GRUs, gated uh, recurrent units. So LSTM has four gates, but basically exactly the same idea. When the gate is open, the gradient flows backwards and it without being multiplied by, by the gate itself. Okay? I will show you some quickly some, some very cool examples of language models. You will see more in the tutorial. So again, this is from Andesha Pati's blog. Basically, of the unreasonable power of uh, recurrent neural networks. So, so imagine that we are building language models. So you will see in the tutorial what is the right way to do language models. But language models can be done on, on, an, on a character-wise basis. So you create language not in chunks of words, but in chunks of character. So you build words character by character. Now imagine that you learn uh, you learn a model on Shakespeare's text. So there, there are many basically training corpus, corpuses with Shakespeare's sonnets and Shakespeare's, basically the full set of Shakespeare's works. Now, I will tell you next week when we talk about generative models how you can actually sample from uh, a recurrent neural network and use it as a generator for sentences in this case. So, so look at these dialogues. Uh, basically, they are synthesized from that are sampled from the network. So, uh, so first of all, Pandarus, of course, is a, is a real Shakespearean character. Uh, Alas, I think he shall become approached in the day when little strain would be attained. You see this typical Shakespearean abbreviation, which is duplicated as well. It will be never fed. Now, of course, this is nonsense. You read a few uh, sentences, this is complete nonsense. But you see, first of all, the words themselves that are assembled character by character, most of them are correct. Are, the, the spelling is correct. Uh, the spacing is correct. The punctuation, there is some punctuation, right? Uh, so, so it's amazing that this so primitive model can generate text. Now, let's see more interesting examples. Uh, this is a synthesized Wikipedia article. So you see, it, it even hallucinated this URL. Of course, it doesn't exist, right? But at least the Synthesis of the URL is correct. <laughs> uh, you see basically this markup of Wikipedia 
is also grammatically correct. Sometimes it, it, it generates XMLs. You see the time step is also syntact syntactically correct. The syntax of XML is correct, even though it is created character by character. I think this is this is interesting. Now, uh, training taking a lot of text, basically type setting for math. So there is a free book on algebraic topology available on the web. So if you train a generative model on this, you end up with something that looks like a math book. So if you try going through it, even without having any notion of algebraic topology, you will see immediately that this is not. <laughs> but it even tries to produce this kind of co community diagram that are so typical in category theory and algebraic topology. Of course, this is nonsense. But still, a nice try. <laughs> <laughs> and this is how the latter uh, looks like. So it, it has mistakes. It will not compile. It will not compile, like you see, it starts beginning enumerate, it doesn't close. With, with end enumerate, it, starts, it closes with end lemma. But with some manual fixes, it still gives you, you see, like it, it will even do some funny things like, uh, let me see, okay, proof omitted. Apparently, this is how <laughs> books on algebraic topology are written. With some proofs omitted, so it, it could replicate probably many proofs were omitted, so it could replicate this kind of a thing. Now, this is another example uh, synthesizing Linux source code in C. So this is a, a synthesized C code. So you see the formatting is very nice. Actually, some comments even appear, <laughs> for completely random. Uh, but you can have some basically some nonsense like a void function that returns the value. It will probably will not compile, so it might yeah. declare variables without using them or use variables without declaring them. But again, just remember that you are expecting too much from something that is created character-wise. Uh, you see, it also learned how to recite the GNU license header. <laughs> so, this, so this is. I mean, there are many, many more examples of three kind of networks. I think this is this is very nice. So so there is really some unexpected power of uh, of, of recurrence that we are uh, we are seeing here. And if you work with slightly more co complicated language models, you will see that uh, actually much better can be done. It's essentially, state of the art in machine translation, for example, is based on on our Now there are, there are there is another very powerful mechanism that can be that can be. Uh, that can be used to uh, to incorporate into uh, the RNN networks. And basically, if we look at how, for example, our vision works, so the, it appears that that the eye, the retina of the eye, has a region about one degree angular aperture that has very dense sample that allows us to read. This is called the folia. And the rest, uh, the surrounding, is sampled much sparser, sometimes even let's say 1% of the density. So basically, we really read with that very narrow tunnel in the foveal area, and we actually are able to see because we move the eye all the time. So this is an eye tracking experiment from the 60s. This is how we actually scan the, uh, the image with, with our sight. And this scanning uh, allows us to, to, to actually see something. So if something is broken in this mechanism, we simply lose the ability of, of sight, even though the photoreceptors work perfectly. Okay? So there have been attempts to replicate this kind of attention mechanisms in, uh, uh, in neural networks. And the idea of attention is very similar to the idea of gating, except that gating is performed sequentially, and attention is performed in part. So if we have, for example, some input, let's think of this in one to many settings. So think of this one-to-many setting. So our, uh, let's say our, okay. So let's say we have some input x. Okay, a regular a regular RNN will take a sequential input. Okay, it will it will produce a new state using WHH times the previous state plus W. Xh, the sequential input plus some bias, 
this will be the state of this, right? Now what we will do instead, suppose we have the, the one-to-many setting. So in one-to-many, we have just one input, okay? So instead of feeding this input to the network, I will feed some modified version of this input, where this modification will be defined by gating the input x by some gate signal g. Okay, so I'm taking my input, gating it by the gate signal g, and the gate signal g will be created from, uh, let's take the sigma here, will be created from my current state. And maybe from the input. Something like this. So basically, this gating, this is called soft gate, uh, which I can, let's say, I can do something like this. I can put an arc tangent here, and then I do soft max. Okay, so let's try soft max here. So soft max makes it into a probability distribution. Right. So basically, I'm I'm putting a soft max here, uh, and this creates a gate. So this soft max selects some kind of a fuzzy and therefore differentiable uh, region in my vector x according to my current state. And then basically I'm just looking at that portion of the image or uh, temporal signal that this vector x encodes. So for example, I can do image annotation by looking every time at different parts of the image. And apparently it is a very powerful, uh, powerful construction. Basically combined with uh, gated networks. So basically, we can use attention and gating simultaneously. These are different things. This gating refers to an input given at once, and gating is the mechanism that uh, uh, records in time. So, we, so gated networks really improve uh, tasks, for example, when we need to annotate images or also translation, uh, translation tasks. Another, another alternative that really competes with, uh, uh, with recurrent networks is what is called temporal convolution networks. So the idea of temporal convolution basically is that instead of looking at something that looks like an in infinite input free spin, basically recurrent neural networks, let's just allow, let's just use a feed forward neural network, which would be sort of an FIR system, a nonlinear FIR. Uh, with a very long receptive field. So first of all, we'll use causal convolutions. Causality means that we don't depend on the future. When we analyze temporal sequences, of course, causality is a very desired property, right? Unlike in images. So if we work with temporal sequences, of course, all the impulse responses will be zero at negative time. This will ensure causality. But still, if we want, if we just use regular convolution, let's say our filter will be enough some k sample, uh, if we increase depth, this k will grow linearly in the depth. So if we want, let's say if we have k equals 3, like a 3 tap filter, and we would like a receptive field of 1,000 uh, 1, samples, we need more or less 300 layers. And this is quite challenging to train a network with 300 layers. What we can do instead, we can use what is called uh, dilated convolutions. So a dilated convolution is simply a regular convolution that uh, that skips samples in uh, uh, in the input domain. So a regular convolution, I remind you, we had x convolved with some filter w at point n was sum over let's say i w i x n minus two. Okay. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to modify this expression. I will call it a dilated convolution. I will put some integer dilation factor d here. And here, instead of skipping i, I will skip di. So if, for example, d equals 1, dilated convolution is exactly as regular convolution. If d equals 2, I will be using the same filter, but it will be effectively two times larger, because I will be skipping every second sample d. Uh, if d equals 4, 
I will be four times larger, and so on. So basically, in dilated convolutional networks, each layer increases the dilation factor usually by a factor of two. So the size of the receptive field of this network is exponentially big in the depth. And in this way, I can obtain receptive fields of many thousands or even tens of thousands of samples with a relatively shallow networks. And of course, I can use tricks like skip connections and dense networks to actually improve the, 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 numerical, uh, the, the, the numerical stability, the trainability of these, these networks within uh, let's say the, same, the same architecture. So basically, there is some growing evidence that it is better to use feed forward with neural networks with these tricks in place of recurrent neural networks. They achieve similar performance. They can learn very long-term relations. Again, for example, here you can say a few layers will give you many hundreds of uh, samples of uh, uh, receptive field. And I will show you an example. And just remember, I had, I had uh, an argument with my colleague Pablo Sprechman two years ago at SCML. He was almost trying to convince me that it, will, it is impossible to synthesize speech by generating it sample by sample. So imagine an audio waveform, even at modest sampling, sampling uh, rate like 16 kilohertz, for example. Basically, you need 16, uh, you need 16,000 samples per second. So a second of speech is nothing, right? So you don't have any context in a second of speech. So basically, you need really long-term relations to be able to synthesize a few seconds of speech. Now, with these temporal convolution networks, with the dilated convolutions, let me show you how synthesized speech what it looks like. So they really synthesize sample by sample. Okay. We're going to have to call in. The convolution is equivalent to placing the polling. It's not a pooling, it's not driving, it's the other way around. So driving makes, basically, skips samples in the output. Here we are skipping in the input. Okay? Sort of dual. But if you place one polling layer and then you form a regular convolution network, then the skip. Still, it's not the same. It's not the same. So I hope you can hear. American Romance and Adventure Film directed by Randall Kleiser. Aspects of the Sublime in English Poetry and Painting, 1770-1850. Well, I think it's not bad. Anybody who here speaks Mandarin? So to me it sounds natural. Okay, so basically this, this network, of course this is a generative model that is uh, given some representation of a sentence at the input. If we now initialize it with something random, this is it. So it sounds like this. Is that was this. There's lots of applications for telling it. Does it make that your favorite? It's very telling to the sonata thing. That came from. So it sounds like gibberish, but still it sounds like human speech and it has some intonation. You can you can hear the basically all the imperfections of the vocal production, like like you can hear this, the breath of the of the speaker. It also applies the same for the Pardon? It also applies the same for the for the language. Basically, when even if you hear a language you don't speak, you can still recognize it. If well, it, sure, sure. So basically, uh, this, if you can you can say. I don't understand what it means, but you know it's English and not Spanish. So well, I don't here, Spanish, but if I so here I don't think there is any syntactic or grammatic structure to it. I don't know, but yeah. it's interesting. No, it's, it's not. It's not grammar. It's phonetics. I mean, basically, if you, I don't know Spanish, but if I hear someone speaking Spanish or speaking Russian, I don't know a ball. Okay. I can tell that he's speaking Spanish and he's speaking Russian because there are some phonetic rules in those languages. Sure. So you basically you are saying that since this was trained on English, it sounds like. English, English like gibberish, right? Maybe, maybe. So I, I haven't tried to analyze, but I think it's impressive in terms of how authentic yeah. it sounds. Of course, when we understand the language, we are much more, uh, we are much more, uh, we are paying more attention to the small bit of this kind of an uncanny valley. It's called uncanny valley. But basically, still, this gibberish looks very 
uh, very authentic. Here are different voices. The avocado is a pear shaped fruit with leathery skin, smooth edible flesh, and large stone. The avocado is a pear shaped fruit with leathery skin, smooth edible flesh, and a large stone. And here, well, we don't necessarily need to synthesize speech, we can synthesize music. <laughs> So first of all, it sounds like a real grand piano. Uh, of course, it happened to me to hear music worse than this. I would probably not listen to it, but at least the... the, the so it's not completely gibberish. The one musician even told me, uh, Master it on the scene, and stuff. Anyway, so I think I think uh, I think this this is a powerful alternative to recurrent networks. This is basically this. The, there is no recurrence whatsoever in this uh, in this model, and it can also be basically temporal convolution networks can be used uh, also uh, for language modeling, especially if combined with attention. I think feed-forward neural networks seem to be. Uh, I would even say probably in the long run a better alternative because they are easier to train. They are much friendlier to hardware because, because RNNs are essentially sequential. Convolutional neural networks, feed-forward neural networks are much easier to parallelize. We'll, we'll see when we talk about hardware. But basically, it's easier to work with feed-forward networks. Less mess. Yes? I'm not sure if I understood the delayed convolutional idea. Uh, because you say that we skip uh, example, is it ended like doing uh, undersampling your input time series? No, no, it's not undersampling, it's, uh, it's the, the other way around, it's over. You see, basically, the convolution here, so the convolution here uses a two-tap filter. It takes, let's say, the average, some weighted average of two adjacent causal mean, right? So here you are taking sample, let's say, zero and one. Here are you are taking sample zero and two. Here you are taking sample zero and four, or zero and three, sorry. Right? So basically, you're skipping samples in the input, not in the output, so which is opposite to strikes. Okay? Well, so next week, so basically, I mentioned a, a, a few times that we can, for example, sample something from an RNN. So the next week, we'll, we'll see a slightly different uh, type of learning problems. Basically, we will talk about generative models and also about different training regimes where we don't necessarily have a well-defined loss function. So we'll also talk about uh, adversarial training. Okay?